thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm your Ron Guru. I am one of the faculty members here at the Bioethics Institute. And uh, thank you for coming on a, a lovely spring Monday uh, for a special guest. I will try not to uh, bastardize your name too much. I apologize, my Polish is uh, far from good. Uh, but it's our pleasure to uh, welcome, uh, and my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Marcin Balagora, uh, who is a uh, visiting Fulbright Scholar at Harvard Medical School, and he's also an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy and Bioethics at Jagiellonian University Krakow. Uh, <laughs> 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 is uh, here to discuss uh, the, some uh, interesting results from the Remedy Project, which stands for Research Ethics and Medicine Study Group, where he works on ethical and policy issues and challenges related with uh, pediatric oncology uh, research and other types of research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. Jagiellonian uh, University, one of the oldest universities in, in, in Europe, uh, Nikolai Kopernik was one of the students there. So it's hard to pronounce, but uh, at least we had one famous student. A few Nobel Prizes in literature, not in bioethics yet. Okay, uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, great uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak here at John, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I will present uh, a study which was recently published and uh, performed with uh, with a bunch uh, which, with, with, with my co operators the study about risk and surrogate benefit for pediatric phase 1 trials in oncology. Uh, There's a systematic review with, with meta-analysis and I will also offer some uh, ethical interpretation of that results which probably be more interesting for at least some people. Uh, that's the group, uh, a lot of people who are interdisciplinary, there were uh, evidence-based ethics, evidence-based medicine specialists in there, uh, people from Cochrane, Poland, uh, two statisticians, Maciej Polak and Dean Ferguson, uh, two oncologists, uh, a lot of bioethicists, and uh, we were mentored and led by Jonathan Kimmelman from McGill University. Uh, we were published in Plus Medicine in, in uh, February this year, so if anyone would be interested in more details, then, then you can find more details at, at this paper. Uh, that's the outline of my presentation. I will offer some. Uh, I will. I will offer some introduction and uh, describe our hypothesis and methods. Uh, describe our results and uh, then also offer some ethical interpretation. Uh, cancer remains uh, the fourth leading cause of death uh, among children in the United States and one of the leading causes of death. Uh, around the world. Uh, cancer in children differs, often differ biologically from cancer in adults, and uh, child's uh, physiology can substantially change drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So drugs in oncology not only should be eventually tested in, in pediatric populations. Uh, phase one uh, trial in oncology aimed to establish uh, safety dosing and preliminary efficacy in, in the tested drugs. Uh, participants in general have advanced cancer and have exhausted standard therapeutic options. Uh, there are several practices uh, to improve risk and benefit in pediatric oncology phase one trials. One of the most important is to delay these trials until we will have uh, at least some preliminary results from phase one trials in adults, especially MTD maximum flow rate dose, which is supposed to make this this uh, this pediatric trials uh, safer. Uh, but we don't we didn't have uh, systematic data on on the relation of risk and benefit in pediatric phase 1 trials in oncology, we had only article published in 2005 by Lee and colleagues. Uh, 
uh, and they found that uh, objective response rate in 2005 in pediatric oncology was about 10%, while toxic death rate was 0.5. Since 2005, uh, many new drug classes have emerged, mostly targeted therapies, and also immunotherapies recently. However, immunotherapies are not uh, included in our study. Uh, and uh, also new uh, dosing strategies, uh, which are supposed to make these uh, phase one trials safer. So, uh, also in treatment, there is amazing mortality rate reduction, which is 1% annual, even more in hematological cancers. And since uh, 1975, uh, death rate for re uh, reduction was more than 50%. It was amazing. Uh, improvement in in, in, uh, in treatment. Our hypothesis, because of because of this improvement in treatment, because of new drug classes, uh, our hypothesis was uh, that risk and benefit is probably more favorable in pediatric trials than trials in adults. Also because of this design features, so delaying. Uh, with phase one pediatric after preliminary results in phase one with adults. And we also expected positive linear trends in objective responses in time. Because we can observe that in treatment. So we also expected that there will be constant improvement, uh, or at least improvement, in uh, phase one trials <coughs> in time. Uh, and that was the aim of our study, to establish the risk and benefit associated with pediatric phase 1 studies in oncology and to compare our results with, with results in adult studies. We register our protocol prospectively in Prospera database describing uh, in data details of inclusion and exclusion criteria and the uh, way how we uh, synthesize these results. Systematically search MBase and PubMed, including solid and hematological phase one pediatric trials published in two, from 2004 until 2015. Uh, we started our study in 2015 and, uh, it, and we, we did it for three years. It was, it was amazing, horrible, very long and hard work. Uh, but uh, eventually we published that. Uh, but uh, that's the reason that uh, we, we finished our, our screening in 2015. Uh, double independent screening, double independent extraction, because of the quality of the systematic review. Uh, we included pediatric cancer phase 1 studies. We define minors on, as individuals below the age of 21 years. We wanted to, this can be surprising because uh, because like from ethical ethical reasons it will be better to include 18 years as as the threshold, but it would be impossible to uh, to e extract uh, data for that that subgroup of patients uh, because inclusion criteria criteria in most of the trials is 20. So that's, that's the reason we, we changed that after our current pilot. <coughs> uh, we defined risk as grade 3, 4, and 5 drug uh, related uh, uh, events. Uh, grade 3 is se severe, uh, grade 4 is life threatening or disabling, and grade 5 drug related adverse event is dead cause of. Of adverse events, mostly like toxicity of the, of the drug. And we define benefit as objective response, both partial or, uh, or, uh, or full response. Uh, then, in, in uh, case of acute leukemia, only, only full response, complete response, because, uh, because that's, that's the benefit in, in, in acute leukemia. Only. Uh, when possible, our data wave were meta analyzed. We stratified our data by the type of cancer, solid or hematological, and class of drug, targeted, hemi or combo, and we performed additional 
uh, statistic tests because of because these data were so heterogeneous that uh, that we had to we had to uh, perform additional tests. That's our results. Are they visible? Not really. So uh, we identified 7,061 records at the beginning of our screening. We included for a full text article screening 687 articles and from those 170 studies uh, fulfilled our inclusion criteria. So we analyzed 170 studies clinical trial phase one, clinical trials in pediatric oncology published between 2005 uh, 2004-2015. Uh, among those, there were 74 studies of targeted drugs, 72 testing classic chemotherapy and 24 testing combination of targeted and chemotherapy. So if, if I'm talking about combo drugs or combination therapies, I'm referring to combination of targeted therapies and classical chemotherapy only. Doesn't mean that in chemotherapy we didn't have more than one agent sometimes. Uh, all these trials enrolled 4,604 patients, uh, and all of them included pediatric <coughs> participants, uh, in, in all of them, the pediatric participants were the majority. Sometimes it was slightly mixed populations. Uh, if possible, we extract only for pediatric populations, but always uh, there was uh, pediatric participants were majority and studies were uh, described as pediatric studies and titles or abstinence. The majority of our studies recommended phase two, 74%. The ma vast majority of studies used conservative dosing dosing strategies where the initial dose increase was less than 100 percent and this was surprise this surprised us because we did believe that uh, there is more experimental approach regarding dosing strategies in pediatric trials just to include more children into this dose dosage which will be uh, suggested dosage for phase two trials which is a bit similar to possible therapeutic dosage. So we, we were surprised that the uh, majority of studies use these conservative dosing strategies. Uh, the pooled of overall objective response rate was 10, about 10 for all trials, which means that about 10% of participants uh, experience any type of objective response as two more, two more shrinkage, for instance. Uh, and it's a huge difference between solid tumors and hematological analysis and malignancies, as you can see. It's about three in solid tumors and uh, almost 30% for hematological malignancies in objective responses. The highest response was found. Now you can, if you like, you can uh, take a look on this table uh, provided there, maybe then it will be made more, more easy or, or more interesting. Uh, uh, these findings are really amazing. Uh, the highest response found in combo therapies, as expected. This, this we, we expected that these are more, you know, uh, the newest ideas combo therapies. So we expected that they would be the highest response. For, we will found uh, the highest response in there. But this is surprising that classical hematoraphic solid tumors was very similar to combo therapies. So most classical and conservative drug uh, has very at phase one has very similar responses as some combo therapies. The lowest, and this is also very surprising, the lowest response was found in targeted drugs. Mm -hmm. On phase one level in pediatric oncology, targeted drugs offer the lowest response according to our systematic report. This is surprised, this is surprising result. Uh, the overall clearly reported drug fatality rate was about 2%, uh, which states for 23 deaths. Uh, and average serious event, uh, uh, 
event rate per person was equal to 1.32, meaning that every participant on average would experience serious adverse event. Uh, we, we wanted to do more advanced calculation, we wanted to pull this data, uh, adverse events data, but because of uh, the bad reporting we were not able, they don't report event per participant, they, they just most of the trials record mostly only adverse events. So we, what we can do with this data doing meta research, we can only uh, we can only calculate average series adverse events unfortunately. But this is also interesting findings findings anyway. Uh, the highest grade 3 for adver uh, adverse events found in combo therapy is also expected that we expected that there would be the highest response but this drug should be prob probably the, also on the highest toxicity and uh, uh, our, our review confirmed that uh, and in classic hematherapy which is also expected the lowest adverse events per person found in targeted drugs. Nothing surprising in here. Uh, this is something which, which we should reflect probably a bit longer uh, because when three or fewer types of malignancies were included uh, <coughs> into, into the trial, the response rate, rate was quite high, it was about 15%. When four or more, more different malignancies were responsible, the response rate was less than three percent. It's a huge difference here, and we think that uh, that that, pos that it's possible that uh, when the researchers have strong trial hypothesis based either on uh, adults results or preclinical results. It means that they are more selective for pediatric patients and uh, at the end, eventually, responses in this phase 1 trials in oncology are, are better, probably because they, from the beginning, had uh, better biological hypothesis before they started to, to set protocol. Unfortunately, we did not find positive linear time trends in objective responses. So, uh, as I said, uh, in treatment at this at the same time we have we have uh, improvement, constant improvement. Uh, we cannot find constant improvement in phase one trials mm -hmm. uh, because there is small decrease here in, in years 2007-2009. This more gray darker are solid tumors and, uh, and uh, another analysis <coughs> and, and in both trials you see that there is tiny decrease in years 2007-2009 there is no linear uh, progression here unfortunately so going back to our hypothesis is the risk and benefit more favorable in pediatric trials than in trials with adults? No, and I will show comparison in the table uh, on, on the next slide. Are, are there any positive linear trends in objective responses? Unfortunately, no. Uh, on average, one in ten children who enroll pediatric phase one trials get objective response. One in 50 dies in, from drug related adverse events, mostly by, by the toxicity of the drug, but not, not only. Uh, despite design, design features, these numbers are very similar to trials with adults. And these are results of previous studies. Uh, studies, not sure whether you can, you can see them appropriately. But uh, there is no many meta research here. There is still a lot of things to do uh, in terms of meta research in, 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 in cancer trials. Uh, most of them are quite old. The biggest were performed by Horstman uh, and Roberts in 2004 and 2005, and some of them, uh, some of them reported solid tumors. Some of them reported both solid and hematological causes. Only our reported both solid and hematological and all pulled all to 
together. But if we'll go to, to uh, and try to, to compare those results, you can see that in solid tumors in uh, 2004, the biggest systematic review performed by Roberts and colleagues, response rate in adults was about 4 in 2004. In our review, it's about 3. So there is no, we don't have better results in it. In, in pediatric phase one cancer trials, unfortunately. Uh, the same with both types of malignancies. In Horst, Horstman, the biggest for among these reviews, Horstman 2005, with 11,000, more than 11,000 adults, uh, response rate is about 10. It's very similar to our response rate, about 10. So despite that there is despite the fact that there is a lot of targeted drugs in our review, despite the fact that the, our review based on <coughs> NTD maximum tolerated dose from adults, there is no improvement in period. The results are very similar, unfortunately, and this, this, this surprises really. Uh, what are limitations of our study? Uh, very heterogeneous set of trials. Uh, serious issues with reporting. I told you that, uh, I, I, as far as I, I remember, uh, the deaths were, treatment related deaths were reported in about 20 percent trials. Uh, otherwise, they do not provide uh, this data. Uh, when researchers uh, publish articles uh, with, with the trials results, they also didn't provide uh, information about adverse events per patient, only adverse events in general, and the types and, or grade of adverse events. It makes meta-research and any, any type of uh, meta-analysis much more difficult. Uh, the very low number of clearly reported uh, deaths. Uh, and this is very important limitation. Response rates are used as surrogate for benefit because objective response in phase one has, for instance, tumor shrinkage, and not always predict improved survival or, or the quality of life. So we are very far from from, from cl classifying this uh, surrogate uh, responses as real life. Uh, uh, benefits for, for, for participants. These are limitations. <clears throat> what are ethical implications? In 2015, ASCO uh, published a recommendation uh, in which they state that participation in phase one trials in cancer is likely to provide patients with improved quality of life. Phase 1 trials can provide patients with clinical and psychological benefits. I don't have any doubts that uh, Phase 1 trials can provide psychological benefits and we should think about that benefit when planning Phase 1 trials, but in light of our findings, it would be probably hard to, how hard to state that uh, Phase 1 trials provide patients with clinical benefits. And ASCO statement was one of the reasons we decided to perform this, this meta-analysis. We want to, to, to check whether they are right somehow. Uh, when we will go to the common rule in US, uh, special protection for children as research subjects, for any protocol involving ch children, IRB has three options. 404, research not involving greater than minimal risk. So in light of our findings, I don't believe that anyone would uh, believe that uh, th th these trials do not <coughs> have risk greater than minimal, since average uh, adverse event is one, uh, grade 3, 4 serious adverse event is one per person at least. 405, research involving greater than minimal risk but presenting the prospect of direct benefit. And this is, this is, this is one of the options, that's at least my interpretation. 
because if you will see, uh, there, there are var various responses in different classes of drugs. So in case of some of those phase one drugs, I would definitely believe that it's reasonable to think that they offer some prospect of direct benefit. Even if this benefit is uh, surrogate benefit, still probably makes sense to, to uh, assess these drugs as offering prospect of direct benefit. But the most reasonable option is, I think, in phase one trials in pediatric uh, oncology 407, research not otherwise approvable, which presents an opportunity to understand, prevent, or elevate a serious problem affecting the health of, or welfare of children. And then I we may refer the protocol to the Department of Health and Human Service for review, for additional review. So maybe that's that's the, in, in, in light of these results and maybe some other meta analysis, that's that's the option to start discussion whether 407 should not be in the US a more commonly used in case of uh, phase one uh, trials. I see some <laughs> skepticism in here. I think it's wonderful, but it's a, you would have a huge amount of pushback from our system. I feel like we're tied to the legal system. We'd be dealing with the lawyers um, all the time. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it seems that it's even more hard in European Union. We have a uh, newish regulation from 2014. And we have two options in Europe. Uh, children can be involved in clinical trials where clinical trials offer direct benefit. benefit. Uh, which is also relative risk here. And uh, another option is some benefit for the population and such clinical trial will pose only minimal risk. So it looks better that, that in this case there is no option for, for performing some types of phase one trials. Hopefully there will be some additional interpretations here. Or, uh, this is also our our review also provides some some data for discussion about famous or unfamous right to try uh, bill in the states. Uh, we do not we do not provide information about phase one, the phase two, which which would be full information for patients who gonna to decide to uh, to participate in phase two trials and right to trial try allows them to do that but at least we provide some basic information uh, even if our trials has so many adverse events and uh, few toxic de death rates uh, 74 of those trials uh, suggested and recommended <coughs> phase two <coughs> and phase two this is so, so, so at least you have uh, some entry information on the on the entry process for phase two trial. I hope I'm, I'm clear with this uh, format. Because right to trial allows patients in life threatening diseases uh, to access to drug after phase one testing. So how we provide information how how phase one did look like and we also see that 74% of our phase one recommended phase two trials. But uh, to have full picture, you need definitely to perform this uh, similar analysis for phase two trials. And then you will have full picture, you can decide in case right to try will, will, will be legislated. Uh, whether you want to participate in phase two trials, you see how many adverse events will be there and how many objective responsibility will be there. Okay, that's it. Bardzo dziękuję. Finally, Polish. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you. So perhaps we, you can just feel free if you'd like, you can call on people, and uh, I think we've got a small enough group where okay. it should be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Could you go back to the slide that describes like, the new EU Standard. Sure. Not sure I read right. So there are two slides. That's article 32. Okay. 
So that's the easy one. Uh -huh. Direct benefit outweighing risks. There's no similar source. Yeah. So any, if it's benefit and no risk. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For the population. Right? What do you think? There's a huge middle ground. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. I think since since the first since I offers, uh, I think that some of those trials in phase one trials would offer direct benefits over weighting the risk of and burdens involved. Uh, when we think what is what is alternative for, for these children, because what what what, what do we have? They exhausted all therapeutic options here, uh, and they, they so so what's, what are the options? Uh, off label, probably drugs. Here for them, if they have exhausted all therapeutic standard therapeutic, or just palliative care. So in some cases, we we could we could maybe. Uh, except that there is some direct benefit or possible direct benefit, at least in some classes of these drugs, uh, for, for for some of those children. But uh, definitely, we cannot think about phase one trials as offering only more risk. I think that we, we do agree. And, uh, yeah. The uh, I said on one of the IRBs here, Hopkins, and we see a fair number of these trials and. I think mostly we approve them as uh, uh, increased risk over minimal risk, but there may be benefit. I mean, that's our general categorization. But we, we struggle some, uh, often with the, the wording in the consent form for, in the benefit section. What do you put in the benefit section? And it comes down to uh, your child may or may not benefit from being in this trial, uh, or uh, sometimes uh, it is unlikely that your child will uh, receive benefit from being in this trial. So I'd be interested in your comments on what you think should be in the consent form. So I I don't know how consent form or consent forms are, are <coughs> constructed in the state, but uh, if we do have consent forms in European Union in Poland uh, for the treatment, then quite often we have we have just. Uh, you know, percentage data regarding risk. And uh, being a parent, I would definitely love to have this information about uh, about historic adverse events uh, from the from the class of drug my kid, my child would be you know involved into. Uh, and uh, I think that we, we provide us those data. No, we do that. Uh, if data. there's information that's provided in the risk section. Uh -huh. But then we get down to the benefit. To, to the benefit. So, so some of those trials do offer some uh, some some promising uh, promising uh, uh, surrogate benefit, I would say. Uh, some classes of hem hematological cancers are really promising, and I would I would I would call, I would describe this as, as potential benefit plus. You know, plus Psychological benefit, and uh, maybe also, I know altruism benefit for for the society. Is, that's one of the benefits. We tend not to include psychological benefits. You can, <coughs> you can, you don't want to. Why not? It's hard to define. Yeah, it's, it's hard, hard to measure. It's hard to measure. Right? To define. Sure. So. I have always been very puzzled about how to define risk in populations um, like it sounds like some of the populations that you're studying um, where they're already facing sort of not great um, uh, health prospects. So for uh, bullet point two here, even though these trials have a lot of aid, I would want to know how that compares to <coughs> what <coughs> prospects look like for these folks outside of clinical research studies. And in some ways, um, what I would really want to know is both for the objective responses and the AEs, which is very hard to know, not 
the total amount, but the marginal change. So like a fatal AE in some ways is less concerning to me uh -huh. than pain that the person would likely not have experienced under standard care. And I think that thinking about what the baseline alternative to the um, treatment is, which is actually seems like it's, that seems like it's understood in the regulation that you compare it with uh -huh. the standard treatment. Um, I think once we recognize that we're supposed to be comparing the standard treatment to the research treatment, um, I'm, it, I think it, it makes it a different question whether the risk is, in fact, um, minimal or more than minimal. Uh -huh. and it makes me more willing to say this risk might be minimal depending on what I know about what the AEs are, are like. Yeah, I, I totally do agree that, uh, that there is much more to, to calculate uh, when you are thinking about globally risk and benefits in pediatric phase one trials and to compare. But, uh, you know, there are some limitations what we can do in meta research. I would love to design uh, research which would compare risk inside trials and outside trials. But, uh, frankly, I have no idea how to do that. Uh, giving the reporting in trials are, you know, not high quality yes, enough. And also, mm -hmm. uh, how to systematically analyze, you know, treatment. We don't have the, the we just don't have this data. This will be, it will be, it will be hard to systematically compare them. You should get somebody to pay you to do it because the regulation <laughs> says in comparison to the standard treatment. So this is really important to do it. It's actually required. As I sure, know. sure. But uh, so what is? But there is, yeah, there is by a definition, problem. these children have exhausted startup treatment yeah. in phase one trials. So I, I see that there is that there are problems with these regulations. These children, by definition, has have exhausted standard treatments. The only compar comparison on comparator here is health label or palliative care, I think. Yeah. So I want to thank you for the talk. It's, it's intriguing data and it, it's forcing us to think. And I'm a pediatric oncologist, so that's my disclaimer. Um, <laughs> there is a. So you, you are doing this better. I'm a bad one. Yes, my wife, yes, my daughter, yes. <laughs> If there's some, there's an argument out there that phase one trials for kids with cancer should not be limited uh -huh. to those who have exhausted standard therapies, mm -hmm. uh, especially given some of the more aggressive diseases and the relatively poor standard approaches for salvage therapy and things like that. And I wonder, have you thought at all about should phase one trials, right? Assuming that we minimize harms, uh -huh. assuming that there's generalizable knowledge to be gained, all the usual things that we say. Have you thought at all about that, whether phase one trials should continue to be in, in light of your data? So I, I definitely do support performing phase one trials in oncology. There's, I, there's no doubt that these trials should be continued and performed. And uh, uh, I just want to show uh, that in light of our data, we should rethink framework, ethical and maybe legal framework for performing that, that trials to make it more positive, that's the Polish word, which comes to my mind, uh, to make it more, more clear for, for participants or for, for, for stakeholders. I don't believe that referring to, you know, to minimal risk and, uh, or slightly up, up or minimal, it's enough to perform these studies. And I also am aware that uh, very many uh, pediatric cancers are rare diseases. I'm aware about uh, mixing treatment and research frame this framework and how how, how pediatric oncology develops. Uh, I just wanted to 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 show that uh, that we probably need more honest framework, ethical and legal framework to, to continue performing these trials. Is is that clear? <laughs> we'll talk some more. We, I get the luxury of that we get to sit and pray for it. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Uh -huh. You had mentioned about the age, the age of the participants in these trials. Uh -huh. could, you, could you clarify? You said your inclusion criteria included those up to 21 and that there was, I, if I understood correctly, because many are in that 18 to 21 year old range. Is that 
what you were implying, or was there? So, what, okay. what are the demographics for? So, so, uh, so it, it, we were not able to systematically compare demographics uh, because of reporting. Because some trials report on average, some trials range. At the end, you are not able to metabolize them. Our inclusion criteria was set in a, in a way that 20 years old is a threshold, and uh, trials has to uh, describe themselves as pediatric trials. Uh, and at the end, when we do the screening and uh, full art, uh, abstracts and full text, we included only those in which particip most participants was, were uh, less than 20 years old. And trial described themselves as pediatric. It's not as pediatric. Is, is that clear? Yeah, yeah. No, but think, if you yeah. would like to, and we are not able, unfortunately, we are not able to provide that information. What, what was the age group? And so we wanted to, you know, we wanted to stratify this data by the age of ascent, mm -hmm. about seven in many countries, because it would be interesting. Uh, we, uh, then maybe 16 in many European countries. It's the threshold of informed consent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. 13 also as additional informed consent for, for parental consent, but no enough uh, data yeah. In, in... Yeah, I think it would be maybe interesting to look at from a regulatory perspective, if you're interested in that, yeah. to look at how those different groups were treated within trials. So to look at if yeah, those above 16, those above 18 versus those below. Yeah, that would how be, those, that those would ethical be, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. I was dealing with ascent and uh, and decent uh, theoretically, so I was really interesting, interested how it really works, but unfortunately, no, no data. In, in your analysis of uh, <coughs> benefit and solitude recruit, mm -hmm. did you break it down further, for instance, certain organs, CNS tumors, for instance? So, no, we, we, since you know this is very heterogenic, we, 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 we stratified this in, at least we had. We have, I think, six different groups, and we keep reporting for adverse events and benefits for these six different groups. So, drug classes and only hematological and solid tumors. We didn't stratify it, uh, we didn't go more, more deeply because it would be you know, very hard to, to synthesize this, this data to make it clear. Do you have any sense of the 170 articles? How many actually did go to a phase two trial? And if you have phase any? two? Yeah, and if you have yeah, so we are we are we are I mean, looking at that data. We, yeah, we are in the middle of of uh, we actually we try to see how many of those uh, ends as registered uh, drugs or combination. These are preliminary data, uh, like for now eight from seven one hundred seven. Uh, it's extremely hard to match phase one trials and phase two trials because you never know whether phase two based on phase one you know when you go to citations it, it looks easy it's like design it's, it's design which came to my mind let's try to do that how many of them but at the end where you are going to d details and you are you know comparing this data you're never 100 percent sure whether this phase two is you know because of phase one data so at, at the end, we will probably just provide uh, the numbers of citation on different phases using data from our phase one trials. So I, I'm not able to ask or answer how many of them went to, to phase two. But eight preliminary data were, were registered uh, eventually. Yeah. So we know that we have an ontology types like our medical or adult ontology colleagues when we talk about phase one trials, mm -hmm. emphasize much more the hope that, and the therapeutic effects of the trial than pretty much anything else. Mm -hmm. um, you do emphasize we the hope. We do. We, 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 we're just as guilty as, our, as the medical oncologists are. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, obviously. And I wonder, and you mentioned that you think there needs, as a result of your data, that you, you all have concluded, you and your colleagues, that there needs to be a different process to the sit-down about, let's talk about the phase one trial. Can you give us some ideas about what that would look like in practice? So I, I, I do, I, maybe I'm naive, but uh, I, I, I'm not dealing with, with 
the other patients, therefore I, I can definitely can be naked with art. But uh, I just know some results of uh, of the of the reasons why parents decide to send children to trials, not phase one, but in general, pediatric trials. And uh, some of these results shows that surprisingly many parents and children uh, be believe in altruistic reasons. So I don't know, maybe that would be one of the honest description of performing phase one trials. However, as I told, there are some drug classes which are very promising in phase one also level. So maybe for those trials, we could say that there are some uh, some possible benefits for, for participation. But, but otherwise, if you have adverse <coughs> event, on average one series of adverse events, one and uh, so limited uh, prospect of, of uh, surrogate benefit, I would not refer to therapeutic options, but uh, you know I'm only theoretician, so I, I can imagine that this is extremely hard work. I do prefer perform meta analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just thinking about this because you you talked about the consent process and having the data as part of it, and so as a parent who does, who's a physician but doesn't do any of this hard pediatric oncology work, I'm thinking of it as if my kid had a hematologic malignancy, and I look at the combined therapy, it's a 44% chance of some sort of benefit, a 6% chance that my kid dies, which is what's happening anyhow. Yeah. I, I, yeah, 44%. Like, it seems like I, a pretty easy it. call for any of these, that as long as the potential benefit sure, is sure. greater than the risk that they die, I mean, of the drug. I, yeah. No, but do you know what I mean? Like, as you're talking about only minimal risk, like, they have 100% risk of death, right? Yeah. So, if they die by the drug. You should come to the pediatric I did enough feeling sarcoma work to teach me that I don't have the stomach for it. Uh -huh. But, like, it, if they have 100% chance of death, and you're trying to, you, you know, it seems to me that it's fairly rational that any parent is going to say, so. I can kill them, the cancer kill them, if the drug kills them, it's still the cancer's fault. Let's so that, do it. Yeah, really. I mean, that's, I, I, I do believe that most parents, if, even if you provide this information, that there is unlikely that these trials will be therapeutic in any sense. I do believe that most parents, maybe children, older children, would still go into these trials because of of this hope. I, and, uh, but, uh, well, I, I personally, if you ask me personally as a parent, then I, I do believe that there are different types of death. Yes. And uh, for some parents, maybe, that there, there is an option to, you know, certain type of death or, or another type of death. That death with, with hope and fight, or maybe death in oh. more calm circumstances. And that's, that's the options for these parents. That's, that's my personal opinion. And I don't know what call I would make with the solid tumor, which is what I think is really interesting about looking at this graph. Whereas we, we know that solid tumors do worse with chemo because they're mm -hmm. solid tumors. Like that's why they usually have surgeries sure. cutting them out. But like for the hematologic, I mean, that's almost a 50% shot when everything else has failed. I think that how you have that conversation and you're really the challenge of a physician who's involved in this research work is like, I'm trying to imagine a parent when suddenly, like, if you see a number 44% and your kid is otherwise done, sure. like, that is, I can't imagine any parent saying, no, I'm not going to try it. 6%, I can see a lot of parents saying, oh, they're going to feel how crappy, they're going to lose all their hair again, they're going to be vomiting, and, like, they're probably still going to die. Maybe not, but 44%, that's... Yeah, you know, absolutely. Kind of but when, when I was when I was talking about this this potential benefit, uh, I all the time tried to exclude some classes of drugs, and I said that for some classes of drugs, there is probably you know this is still surrogate benefit. Doesn't mean that that it will be real life benefit. Uh, but even though. Uh, I still think that we can honestly say that for some drug classes and some types of malignancies here, we can honestly say, look, 
there is potential benefit, 44 per person. Therefore, I try to keep always this, you know, part for this. Can you define surrogate benefit for me? So, so you know, if uh, the drug is registered at the end, uh, now it's more and more uh, drugs registered in the FDA, and there is ongoing discussion because of PFS. Uh, but uh, but if the drug is registered, it, it should show the real type benefit, which is prolonging of, of life or quality of life. And so the surrogate is. And surrogate here, there there are racist criteria, and there are this surrogate were defined or the surrogate were defined by in in the particular trial by researchers referring to some uh, you know, norms re regarding how to define them. For instance, tumor shrinkage uh, for one centimeter in some cases can be this objective response and this is, and this is a sort of criteria. Probably oncologists can say more. No, you, you, you did fine. Um, I want to ask you to clarify a little bit about the response rate and you may have presented this in if I missed it, I apologize, but sure. did, did you all define duration of response and was that included? Because that's, you could have a response, an objective response yeah. that could yeah. be for a month yeah. and then the tumor blows up. And is that included in that 44% data? Because that's very, because typically that's what we see with a lot of these phase one studies. It may call progression, right? And that's a response. And, yeah. Or you may get shrinkage of one tumor and get another one. Was, did you guys include that? No. When you go to these trials, when you see all of them again, 170 trials, when you read these articles, you will be surprised how many data is not there. Oh, we, right. would love, we would love to have this. We will be not able to, uh, to include this information. There is no information about that kind of data. Sometimes so that's a very important caveat. Abs yeah, absolutely. Right? To, say, to say 44%, I think that needs to be included in that. In the, in the limitations of, of should, the data, okay. because yeah. that's, that's a very, that's a key, because the parents are sad savvy. Um, this isn't their first rodeo. They, they've been enrolled on a phase three trial already, usually, or um, yeah. they're going to ask that data. That's, I, 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 again, I, I may be wrong, but I also think that when they finish phase one trials quite fast and they want to perform maybe phase two, not often they do follow ups and they are able to you know observe this data and uh, whether this response was longer or you know or they just they just you know register data closing down the trial and, and that's it some of these children will die unfortunately some of them maybe will, will go to another trials but uh, nobody's doing follow-ups, I think. That's, that's my gap. In most of the cooperative group trials, they, are, they do report the duration okay. of follow-up okay. and the, the length of response. In phase three, you mean? Or in the all of them? Okay. Probably okay. What's probably happening is that when they go to publish this initial data, they don't have that long-term follow-up. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's possible. They publish a little bit, but they are. You were able to analyze what you could find. Yeah. Is there a concern that there are trials that probably negative or increased risk that didn't get reported? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. These result, these results probably are unfortunately these results are very optimistic. Yeah. Uh, we also, you know, it's hard to do it systematically, but we also plan to do analysis how many of those were reported, registered trials were reported, how many were not. But I, I, I do afraid that many negative trials will never report, unfortunately. So these data are one of these are surrogate, surrogate benefits from all published data only. Any other questions? Thank you.